Well, hey, good morning. I am not Pastor Charlie Martin. My name is Chad Everhart. I'm filling in for Pastor Charlie. Um, if you're tuning in with us, it's good to be with you this morning. Um, and so hopefully you've had a great Christmas and you're looking forward to what God's uh, going to be doing in the future here in 2021 and closing out 2020. Before we get started with the message today, I'd just like to open up in a word of prayer and just to get us in a posture and mindset of worship before we begin. So would you join me in prayer as we begin? Father, I thank you so much for this day. God, it's been a, a crazy year and a crazy time and um, just even this situation here this morning, um, being virtual as we worship you, God. I, um, Things aren't what we always expect them to be. But God, we trust you. We love you. And we want to just worship you this morning in this time that we have. And so I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would uh, speak to all of our hearts. Would you open our minds, open our hearts to what you have for us this day? God, I pray that you would be exalted through the preaching of your scriptures, God, that we would hear your word and it would transform us, God, that we would not leave this moment virtually that we have here on YouTube or Facebook or whatever we're doing to watch this, that we wouldn't leave this without being changed because your word is sufficient and it's effective for our lives. So God, help us to press into what you have for us this morning. Let us to just be listening uh, with great anticipation, but let us just be exalting of you and who you are and how we apply this to our lives. So we show the world that you are, we are your followers and that we worship you. And so thank you again for this morning. Thank you for this church and Thank you for this opportunity, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> all right, let's get started. Well, I know the last thing you want to talk about is COVID-19, because quite honestly, I don't want to talk about it either, but I don't know how we can't, when we get to the very last Sunday of the year of 2020, for most of us, probably the most challenging year of our lives, it's honestly the last thing we want to talk about. But when we think about the things of God, and we think about what it means to follow Jesus, how can we not talk about that? And so we need to close out this year really thinking about 2020 um, very introspectively, taking a look at ourselves and seeing where we are at as individuals, uh, but also as a church, as a corporate body, we need to be thinking about these things because I love New Year's. It's a great time to have a fresh start. And so we want to do that. We want to look back, think about some things, but also be ready so that we can move forward. Well, COVID-19 has no doubt rocked the church. And when I say the church, I mean the big C church. I mean the church at large, not this individual local assembly of a church. But the church in general has no doubt been rocked by COVID-19. <clears throat> I've seen that in a variety of local churches, but you can just see that in the news and everything that is going on out there. It's no doubt a major storm that God has used to expose some weaknesses, right? Like we've seen some weaknesses, uh, obviously with technology. Um, this church has done a great job in catching up with that, but a lot of churches are still struggling, may have nothing going on. And so they realize like maybe have fallen behind the times on that. Obviously just gathering in general is very difficult and it's exposed weaknesses. Like uh, for, for a lot of churches, how do you get together when you can't get together? And so COVID-19 has no doubt done that um, and God has used that to say, hey, church, wake up. You guys aren't doing this in ways that you could be doing it to glorify me and to worship me. But I got to tell you that God has also used this storm of COVID-19 to raise some very serious areas of concern. And I would say that those are foundational beliefs and practices that the church at large has really, really messed up on. And I say foundational because they are things that oftentimes we take for granted. They're things that are uh, below the surface. They're not always so visible, but they are the most important things and they matter tremendously. The foundational beliefs that we carry and the foundational practices of being a church are essential. They are essential. And so, no doubt, I would say that 2020 has also done something else with regards to exposing things within the church. And that's this. It has shown what is authentic and what is counterfeit. And that, those are kind of scary words. Maybe we don't like to think about it in those terms. 
but I do believe God has been doing a work within his church, the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, in trying to prepare her and make her pure and holy. And so what's shaken out during this time of storm with COVID-19 is what's authentic and what's counterfeit? What's the real thing and what's not? Because once we get our, our foundational beliefs and practices are exposed, we start to see what's real, what's true, what's authentic. And we start to see what's not. Okay, so it's a lot like the foundation of a building, right? And I'm actually going to go down that road today because I'm an architect. A lot of you that know me from when I was a, a member and participant in this local assembly many years ago would remember me as the crazy architect that lived in Bethel Valley. I uh, had the weird house up the road on Mountain Dale. So anyway, uh, you might have known me as that. And I love talking about buildings. But God talks a lot about buildings, and God is the chief architect of all things. And so, you know, it's, it's very good to kind of use a lot of the terminology he uses and metaphors he uses. And I think this will be helpful as we start to look back on 2020 and prepare for 2021. We start to look at things from this building perspective. And I really want to focus on foundations. Because I do believe, as we talked about, that foundations have been exposed during this time, and foundations matter. So I've been designing buildings for a long time, and one of the things that I do as an architect is I want to make sure that I design good, solid foundations. I try my best to do that because I want my buildings to stand. That would be the worst thing in the world to have one of my buildings fall down. So it's very, very important. But those of you who have built a building in the high country, know that getting out of the ground, building the foundation is the hardest part of building around here because we have lots of rocks and boulders and you know you might even have uh, something else in the ground, maybe like a spring of water or something like that. And all of those things really complicate building buildings around here. Even if I'm looking out here at the, the uh, construction site over here, that took a long time. I remember when the foundation was being dug out and all the things that were being done to prepare for that. Here in the high country, foundations obviously matter, and they're a very difficult part of the process. Well, faulty foundations are a major problem. Let me give you a, an example to get us kind of started here to think about faulty foundations for a minute. And it's going to be on the other side of the pond, on the other side of the Atlantic, in a little country known as Italy, uh, with this building that you may have remembered. It's called the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Now, not, not pizza. Pisa. Stay focused with me. Don't get all excited about lunch yet. yet. Let's focus on this for now. But the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Well, it's this building, and you, you know what I'm talking about. It's been leaning like this for hundreds of years, actually. Well, it's leaning that way not because of wind, and there's just like violent storms, and just over time it's blown over. And it's definitely not from all the tourists who go up and touch it and, you know, take some cool selfie or whatnot, making it look like they're holding it up. It's not from people pushing on it or anything like that. Everybody's dug out around or done anything. No, it's a faulty foundation that led to that. The folks that built that tower hundreds of years ago did not take into account the soil that was there. It was very loose, uh, not very good soil to build on. They didn't replace that soil and they didn't go down deep and hit rock. And so what happened is, is that part of the soil was good, part of the soil was bad, and when the soil was bad, the building actually sank. And so that's why it's leaning the way that it is. It's a faulty foundation because it is built in an area that cannot hold up its weight. So one thing that foundations do is they do bear the weight of a building, and when they don't bear it in an equal way or an equilibrium is what we use, a fancy word there, then you're going to see sinkage. And you might even see that in your own house with walls that have sunk or you've got uh, sloping ceilings. That's because your foundation has sunk some. But foundations are also really important from a building standpoint from keeping buildings from blowing away. Uh, again, if you know me, you know I'm from the coast of North Carolina, from Wilmington, where we get hurricanes like every year just constantly moving through. And buildings can be ripped off their foundation, literally blown away or washed away by floodwaters that come through. And so foundations are also necessary to keep a building tied down, not just for bearing the weight of it, but keeping it from blowing away. So foundations matter. Well, since we're in this tough year of 2020, and we've definitely experienced a, a storm with COVID and the quarantines and all the uh, just things that are 
difficult during this time of life that we have, I think it's important that we look at a passage to help us close out that really does look at foundational issues and really shows us that the foundations of our lives as individuals and the foundations of our local churches do matter. They are essential, actually. And before we can build into this new year and build something new, we need to make sure that our foundations are in the right place. And so if you have your Bible, I want to tell you to go ahead and pull that out or pull out your device. We're going to be in Luke chapter 6. You're going to be reading verses 46 through 49, just a handful of verses here. Also, I just challenge you to grab a piece of paper and a pen or something. I'll give you some things to write down that you can take notes on, some points from this too. But I want to read our passage here because I think it's going to really help us as we consider closing out a tough year and looking towards building on a new year. If you want to follow along, I'll be reading in the ESV translation. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he is like. He's like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when a flood arose, the stream broke against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who hears and does not do them is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. When the stream broke against it, immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. And so we can see here, Jesus is going to use, he's been using these word pictures, um, and he's going to continue using one here that's really, really important. This, this passage is actually a part of a, a longer sermon that Jesus has given that started several verses before this. The Beatitudes and some other things are included in this. It'll so feel very familiar for sure. <clears throat> but what he has laid out is what it means to actually follow him. What does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus? Because there's a lot of people that were following him and who he was teaching in this sermon. And what he has said to them is this. Judaism isn't enough. All the things that, that were ceremonial and civic in the law that were there as a part of the Jewish heritage and culture and religion, it's not enough. That's not what it's going to take to follow me. That's not where salvation is really going to come from. All of that's actually been pointing to me, the Messiah. He also tells them the following rules isn't enough, right? The Pharisees and all these other religious leaders are even amplifying things and showing, hey, we're, we're trying to get closer to God by following rules. He says, not enough. He's always contrasting what it means to follow him with those people. He also says that being good isn't even enough. You could try all you want, but that's still not going to be enough. It's only going to be possible to follow him if you trust him. If you put your faith in him and the gospel, that is the only way it will occur. So you've got to believe in the work of Christ and you've got to repent of your sin. Then you can follow him. That's what he's been telling them. And he's concluding all of that with this uh, kind of graphic illustration, this word picture to kind of tie it all together and really show them something very important. And that's this. You can't stay the old person you were. You have to be transformed into a new person. And so he actually uses this construction metaphor, which is helpful for a guy like me who likes buildings, right? He uses this construction metaphor to tie it all together and to show them this contrast between authentic disciples and counterfeit disciples. Authentic disciples and counterfeit disciples. And he's going to use this passage in Luke chapter 6 to show them this. So if you're writing this down, here's the first point you can take note of here. Obedience to Jesus commands determines one's true identity as a disciple. Obedience to Jesus' commands determines one's true identity as a disciple. We see that play out here in verse 46. Let me reread that for us again. It says this, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? So he starts with this question, for them to get them to really start to think about this before he paints the word picture for them and gives them this very clear illustration. Here's a tough question for you guys. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you to do? And so he's speaking to lots of people. All these people are following a great multitude, as you see at the beginning of chapter 6, and they would call themselves his disciples because they're following him. That's what it means to be a disciple. It means to follow a teacher, to follow somebody. And he's going, well, why would you call me Lord, Lord? You're not going to do the things that I've just told you you need to do. 
Okay? And so um, he says this thing, Lord, Lord, to really emphasize that too, because he's more than just a teacher. He wants them to know, like, okay, you're calling me Lord, Lord. You guys believe that I am the anticipated Messiah. But what you're saying when you say Lord, Lord is, I am more than just an authority in your life, more than just a great teacher. You're saying I'm the master of your life, that you submit to me and you do what I say, that you are obedient to me. And so when you use the term Lord, you need to realize that there's a lot more to it than that's just like uh, Jesus' first name. When you say Lord Jesus Christ, that's not what it means. That's, that's, that's who he is. That's his identity. And so he says that. I'm your master to whom you submit. He even says Lord, Lord twice to reemphasize that. To say, no, this is who you call me. I am the master. And you're going to submit to me both now and in the future. Your whole life is in complete submission to me as Lord. And he says this, well, if that's the case, then your actions need to match what's coming out of your mouth. What you're saying, who you profess to be, you say you're one of my disciples, then your life needs to look like it. Your actions need to match it. Because if they don't, guess what you are? You're a hypocrite. And he's been calling out hypocrites, the teachers of the law, the Pharisees, all these people. But he's telling just the plain multitudes here, hey, you're no different than them. Be quite honest, if you don't do what I tell you to do, if you're not obedient to what I say, you're a hypocrite just as much as they are. And he actually is just expanding upon what he said one verse before this in verse 45. Let me read that for us so you understand where I'm coming from. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure produces evil. Watch this. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. And so whatever your affections are, whatever is in your heart is going to be what you say. It's going to be what you do. And he is showing them that, like, look, these two things have to match. You need to obey what I say if you really are my disciples. Otherwise, you're just taking a walk with me. And so Jesus has just explained in this whole sermon what it really means to be a disciple. He is saying that you have to repent. You have to quit going your way, and you have to follow my way. That is what it's all about. Because the gospel, he says, transforms one's actions. It's going to transform your heart, but a transformed heart is going to lead to transformed actions. And this is the gospel message. The death, burial, and resurrection of Christ brings us life. That is the gospel message. But an authentic believer experiences that. It's not that you just believe that Jesus uh, lived, died, was buried, and resurrected. That's good information, of course, important information to be saved. But actually, you experience that same process yourself when you are truly saved, when you're an authentic believer. Because, see, you die to your sin. There's a death to your sin. Jesus died. You're going to die, too. You're going to die to your sin. There's going to be a burial of your old life, just like Jesus was buried in a tomb. And you're going to be resurrected, just like Jesus was. You're going to be resurrected uh, to a new life, a transformed life. It's not the same life that you have. It's not it's just tacking on of a new thing. It's a brand new life, death to your old life, resurrected to live a new life, which we see so often in baptism. It's a picture of that, right? And so this idea of faith in who Christ is and what he's done and the repentance and turning from our old life and bearing it and becoming a new creation is going to be expressed by loving obedience to what Jesus says. That's what he wants us to know here is that we're going to obey what he commands if we really are his disciples. Otherwise, we're just hypocrites. We don't practice what we preach. Now, there's a lot of famous hypocrites in our world, right? Like, we can look around in culture. They're everywhere. Tons of people. Um, I kind of like picking out celebrities to, to make fun of on this because they're just people who live in the public eye and they make lots of money and, you know, whatever. They're just, they're kind of easy targets for this. I shouldn't say I'm picking on them, but they're, they are easy targets for this. One I like to pick on when it comes to something like this, who I think is a major hypocrite, and I don't know, I might get in trouble for bringing him up on this one day when he's like trolling me on, uh, you know, social media or something. Who knows? But uh, Leonardo DiCaprio is a guy. Uh, you might know him. Of course, all the women are going to know him from like movies and stuff. You know, this good looking dude. And he's like this environmental crusader. Like, we've got to save the planet. And look, I believe in environmental stewardship. I believe actually God's called us to that. So don't hear me wrong on here. 
But he's a major hypocrite. He never practices what he preaches. So he tells everybody else they've got to like live this really minimalistic lifestyle, basically in a cardboard box and never drive a car. Yet he's flying all over the world, going on fancy vacations in a private jet. So, you know, like that that's the kind of picture of hypocrisy right there, right? Preaching something, saying you're something, but then actually not doing it. <clears throat> well, we see that, unfortunately, in the church, too. And I hate that because we can definitely see over the last few decades so many leaders in the church who have just not practiced what they've preached. They've fallen into sexual immorality. They've become consumed with their fame and they're just arrogant, egotistical, or maybe just consumed with money and turned into full-blown prosperity preachers. There's a lot of things that we even see in the church where there's this great hypocrisy. And really, they don't understand the gospel and what it really is, or they wouldn't go down that road. And so, as we take this point, when we really think about obedience to Jesus' commands determines our true identity as a disciple, we've got to figure out how we apply that to our life. I mean, where do you need to apply it? Where do I need to apply it? And we need to ask ourselves some serious questions here. I mean, like, does our confession in Jesus as Savior and Lord, does that actually match my lifestyle? Does it actually match the words that I'm saying? I, I mean, is, is he really Lord of every aspect of my life or is he Lord of like 85% of my life or 65% of my life? And am I being obedient? Am I being obedient to who he's called me to be and what he says to do? Am I really being obedient to what he says in here? Or am I just picking and choosing right, and neglecting the things that are in there? We all need to take a serious evaluation here at the very last Sunday to go, am I obeying? Because if I'm not obeying and if I'm deliberately in sin, I've got to kind of question, am I really real? Am I, am I authentic as a disciple? Or am I really an imposter? Am I really uh, posing as something that I'm actually not? Or uh, where do I need to change so that I truly can get some of this garbage out of my life and be obedient everywhere? We all need to take evaluation of that there. When next, Jesus is going to contrast spiritual houses. This is where the construction metaphor really comes in. And so he starts off with everybody understanding, hey, you, if you call me Lord, you need to obey. And let me show you what that, how that plays out. He's going to contrast two types of spiritual houses because that's a metaphor for our spiritual lives. All of us are building some sort of spiritual house. We are doing that. We are building a spiritual life. You can't be in neutral. I think a lot of people think that. I'm like, eh, I'm not really doing much with this right now. You're either building a holy spiritual life focused on being a disciple of Jesus or you're building the opposite. And that's what he says here. And so he's going to show us this contrast that we need to take into account as we look at our individual lives. And so point number two, if you want to write this down, is this. A spiritual house built with the gospel as its foundation will be confirmed as authentic. A spiritual house with the gospel as its foundation will be confirmed as authentic. That really plays out in verses 47 through 48. I want to read those again for us so we can start to see this metaphor play out because Jesus is the master teacher and he loves to use word pictures and metaphors to help us to see this in a way that we can understand it. He says this, everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them will show you what I will show you what he is like. It's like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when a flood arose, the stream broke against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. And so we see here in verse 47, some very clear things that are very important. I want to highlight these for us real quick here. Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them. It's really clear, like to be a disciple, you've got to do a few things. First, you've got to come to Jesus. That's what he says. Anyone who comes to me believes in me first. And then what does he say next? Here's my words. Okay, so we, we come to him. We believe in him. We hear what he has to say. And then finally, does them. We've got to put our faith in action. It can't sit idle. We have to do something with it. That's a response to the gospel in faith and repentance. And he's making that really clear here in that first verse, verse 47. Like, to be a disciple, first and foremost, you've got to do that. You've got to come to me. You've got to believe in me. You've got to take my words, and you've got to go and then do them. But then in verse 48, he talks about this, these well-built spiritual lives. Those are ones that are built on this gospel, that are built on the work of Christ. And they're not shaken by anything. 
I mean anything at all. It's not that Jesus doesn't believe that life isn't going to be hard, because these people probably lived a significantly harder life than we do in a lot of ways, okay? It was hot, it was dusty, there weren't a lot of, wasn't a lot of food, a Roman oppression, a lot of things that we're not experiencing, even though we're inconvenienced, and these are somewhat difficult times now. But in comparison, this was a lot harder life. And he's saying, look, I get life's going to be hard, but when the storms of life come, a true disciple is going to be able to stand. They're not going to crumble under the weight of when things come. And so he's helping them to understand what repentance really looks like. What does it really mean to get rid of my old life and to focus on my new life in Christ? He gives them the word picture and he gives us this today as well. It's going to be like digging down deep. That's what repentance is like. It's like going through the dirt as deep as possible and removing every earthly thing possible, right? Like that's dirt, earth, right? You get out all of that earthly stuff until you hit what? The rock. Until you hit the rock. Until you hit Jesus and then you attach to him. That is what it looks like. That's repentance right there. And so just like with a build, a, you know, a physical building foundation, the best building foundation you can have is, is when you dig down, you dig down, and you hit solid rock. When you hit bedrock and can attach to it, your building will go nowhere. Jesus paints that picture here for us uh, with this illustration, but he's talking about himself. That's what we are to do. So he's not just talking, he's not just because he was a carpenter enjoying talking about buildings. He's talking about him and he's talking about our lives. As you build your spiritual house, dig all that earthly stuff out until you hit Jesus, the rock, and you attach to him. But then there's another thing in here we need to see as well. So we see this idea of digging down deep, laying a foundation on the rock, but then we're going to see that a flood comes, that there's this judgment that comes, and this is divine judgment. This is, this is from God. It's not the final judgment, but this is the judgment of just the stuff we deal with on a day-in, day-out basis. This is everyday life stuff. This flood is God's judgment on our life. And you go, well, <clears throat> I'm a believer. I shouldn't experience this type of judgment. It's not that um, we're getting uh, the final judgment and, and it's going to uh, lead to uh, divine uh, uh destruction. It's not going to lead to hell or anything like that. We are saved and we're secure. What, it, what he's saying here with this divine judgment is the storms of life are things that God brings to us to show whether we're authentic or not. And that might seem a little bit uh, tricky right there. And it might seem a little bit harsh. It may not feel very comfortable. But God does allow things to occur in our lives, aka COVID-19, right? Things to occur in our lives that are going to test our foundation. Really, what are we built on? What are we attached to? So God allows our lives to be tested just like a house with a foundation. If floods are going to come in and it's going to show the authenticity of our discipleship and of our faith. There's a, a great illustration of this. I don't know, y'all might remember this, some of you will, but like in the maybe early 2000s, became really popular in like the corporate setting. They'd have these like posters, they were black, and they'd have a picture in the middle, and uh, at the bottom would be like a word like uh, persevere, or uh, leadership, or power, or something like that. There'd be some sort of quote underneath uh, that reinforced that, like, uh, you know, watch out for the storms of life kind of thing, or whatnot. And there was one that was focused on this, and I can't help but think of it uh, in using it to illustrate this point. It's a picture, and I don't even know what the word was. I probably should have looked it up before I preached this morning, but there's some sort of word on there, but it's the picture that really stands out to me. It's a picture of a lighthouse, and this lighthouse has like a 40-foot wave coming over top of it, and there's a little guy standing at the door, and the other water's like crashing all around, and this lighthouse is built out in the middle of the ocean on a giant rock. And northwest France, where this lighthouse is, it's a pretty old lighthouse. It's been there a long time. It's been through numerous huge storms. But this part of um, France gets tremendous storms. Big waves come there. And it's never knocked that lighthouse over. It's always been there. And so I always remember looking at that poster amongst all these other posters, kind of cheesy and like the corporate world that are out there, kind of leadership type posters. And I remember that image because it was really, really powerful. That's something that's built on the rock. 
This is where the floods and the waves come, and it will not be knocked over. And that's what a true disciple's life looks like. It's not that those waves aren't going to come. It's not that the storms aren't going to come. It's not that we're not going to experience that stuff. It's that we're going to stand firm in the midst of that. And that's the picture that he's really painting for us here with this uh, illustration of construction and with foundations. And so when we look at how do we apply this principle about being a spiritual house that's built on the gospel as a foundation, how do I apply that to my life uh, each and every day? I've got to like look at the floods of my life. I've got to look at the storms of my life. I've got to look at the giant waves that are crashing over it. And I've got to figure out, am I authentic in those moments? Um, has my faith been proven? Has it been tested? Has it been shown to be true? And can I mark those moments? Can I look back over the course of my life and go, yep, I made it through that. Yep, I made it through that. God is good. He is gracious. He sustained me. I am planted on the rock. And can we do that even with 2020, right? Like, not a great year. Don't want to reflect back, but we've got to. We've got to go back right now. That would be the, probably the best application at this point for right now is to look back over this year. Sit down, pause you know, over the next couple of days before we get all into making resolutions we're never going to keep and all that kind of stuff, think about this year and can you mark those moments where you're like, man, that was tough right there, but God was faithful and I was able to stand because I was on, I was built on the rock. I was firm in my foundation there and be encouraged by those moments because those are the things that will catapult us into doing more and more for the kingdom and following Jesus in a stronger way and will help us endure even further into 2021 because I'll be honest with you, I'm not sure 2021 is going to be much better, y'all. So let's go back and mark those moments to help us to endure during these times that we're in and have confidence in the rock in whom we are built on. Last but not least, the third point here is the contrast. And it's definitely the harsher one here that Jesus brings up. So point number three is this. A spiritual house built without the foundation of the gospel will be exposed as counterfeit. A spiritual house built without the foundation of the gospel will be exposed as counterfeit. Well, he finishes that up in verse 49. Let's read that one more time. But the one who hears and does not do them is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. When the stream broke against it, immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. He's saying here in verse 49, this is someone who hears the gospel. They got all the facts. They got all the information. Like I said earlier, important information. We got to have uh, this understanding of the death, burial, life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and understanding even what the gospel is. So they know all that, but they build a life without it. They know all the information. They hear it. They've been around it, but their life is not actually built with it, not built on it. They've never actually dug down deep. They've never gotten to the root of things. They've never gotten down to the bedrock. They have not gotten out those earthly things, that repentance of digging all of that out. They haven't done it. What they have done is they've stayed on the surface. Did you see what Jesus said? They built this spiritual house. It looked good, but they built it on top of the ground. They didn't actually go down and they didn't dig. They didn't build on the rock. And so this is a spiritual house that looks good on the outside. And it's above ground. And so you don't really know what's going on under the surface in most buildings. You could have a building that's built on top of the ground and you wouldn't even know it a lot of times. And this is a house that may be all too familiar for many of you watching today. It's a spiritual house built with good works for, towards other people. Um, it's, a, it's a spiritual house built with religious activities, going and doing lots of things that, that look like they are of the Lord. It's a spiritual house that's built with strong church attendance. Never missed a Sunday morning, never missed a Wednesday, maybe until COVID hit, right? Uh, but you know, never had any church attendance problems. A spiritual house that is built with very strong moral actions. You've never cussed, drank, spit, smoked, all that kind of stuff. Never done all that, right? This is a spiritual house is built with incredible Christian service, maybe even serving in the church in a, a very visible capacity. It's a spiritual house that's also maybe even built with lots of mission trips and things like that. But what Jesus is saying is, this isn't enough. This isn't enough. There's got to be a heart transformation. The gospel really has to change you. 
That's the only way you are going to be a disciple. Otherwise, you are counterfeit. You have built a building that has not gone down and dug out your sin and gone down and hit the rock of Jesus and really trusted in him for all of your life. Instead, you've built up on the surface where everybody can see it and everybody may even applaud you for who you are and all of this stuff that you've done that looks very Christian, but you actually don't even know Jesus. You don't really know him. You're not a true disciple. You are actually a counterfeit. It's like a Christian veneer with no foundation at all. That's what Jesus is talking about. To scare maybe all of us a little bit more here and, and, and really assessing where we are with this, you can go to Matthew chapter 7 and read honestly what I believe are the most terrifying words in the Bible. Matthew chapter 7 verses 21 through 23. Let me read those to help us all be sobered by this for, for just a moment. Jesus says this in a, in a comparable sermon here, right, um, with the Beatitudes and other things, the Sermon on the Mount. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? Uh-oh. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Those are scary words that are in the Bible. There's a lot of people that look like they know Jesus. They look like they are following. They look like they are doing all of the right things. But in their heart of hearts, they don't know him. They've never repented of their sin. They've never put their trust and their faith in Christ and by his grace. They've done it by their own works and their own efforts. You can see that is not where we want to be. That's not what we want because he is calling them, unfortunately, it's a harsh word, imposters. There are going to be Christian imposters. And so these are people who've never died to their sin. They've never died to it. They've never buried their old life and they've never been raised to new life by the grace of God. That's never occurred, even though you've seen them in church their whole life. And they've done everything and anything to show that they are Christians. But their heart paints a very different picture. When you look below the surface, when you get to the foundational level, when you get underneath what's there, it's really not what it was said it was. It's not true. It's counterfeit. It is an imposter. There's a good illustration of this. Um, there's a movie called Catch Me If You Can. Actually starred Leonardo DiCaprio. I don't know why I'm on him today, but hey, whatever. Uh, but Catch Me If You Can, it's about this guy named Frank Abagnale. And he was like one of these incredible imposters, like con men type of guys. So if you saw the movie, I'm not trying to give it all away, but like he ends up pretending to be all these kind of notable people so he can make money and you know, just kind of scam people. So he pretends to be an airline pilot and a doctor and gets all these fake credentials and everything. He looks like the real thing, but he's not. He's never done any of those things. Never went to law school, never went to medical school, but he was able to generate all this stuff. And so from the outside, all the people that met him thought he was a great guy. He was super professional. He's doing all this stuff. The government catches on and, and finally captures him. It's like FBI kind of thing. But what an imposter. Everybody was totally deceived by him. And you can see that with lots of other people as well within entertainment and culture and just society at large. But so many of our churches, that's the situation that we see there too. It looks good on the outside, but what's really there, what's underneath the surface is not true. And so when we look at this point, and I know it's a hard one, but a spiritual house built without the foundation of the gospel, when we look at that, We've got to look introspectively. We've got to look at our lives. And when we try to apply it to our lives, we've got to ask ourselves some tough questions. When the floods come, is, is my faith real uh, or is it proven to be counterfeit? I mean, every time a flood comes, when a storm comes, when something hard comes, do I run to Jesus? Do I cling to him? Am I cling to the rock or do I cling to the world? Do I run to this? Do I run to that? Do I run to substances and, and addictions and to sex and to all these other things that might make me feel better, but I never run to Jesus? I need to probably ask myself a question here. Do I actually know him as Lord? Or am I going to be one of those people in Matthew chapter 7 that when the final judgment comes, he's going to say, I never knew you. You called me that. But you never came to me in those tough times. You proved that you weren't real. You proved that you were an imposter. And I'm showing that to be true here at the end of time. And so we need to really look at our 
own lives and ask ourselves that question. Again, looking back over 2020, looking back over our lives and going, can I see all those tough times, see all those storms, see all those hard moments? And, I, and I'm not saying we aren't going to mess up from time to time. Don't hear me on that. I'm not claiming Christian perfectionism or anything like that. But I am saying that there are patterns that we need to consider. We need to make sure that we really are grabbing hold of Jesus when times are hard. Because if not, then we're not really who we say we are. The fruit of our life is very different. What's in our heart is definitely different than what's coming out of our mouth and through our actions. And so again, kind of a hard closing here with that point, but you know, so important as we close out a year and we think about the season that we're in, I can tell you that in the last five years of vocational ministry to young adults, I have seen this play out so often. This is so real. It's not just something that I've just lifted out of scripture here and trying to prove a point here, or, or maybe it's a one-off thing. This is rampant. And you maybe have seen it, and maybe I've seen it too with COVID as well. I have seen a lot of people have their faith tested during this time, and they prove that they are not real, that they really don't know Jesus. And I've seen people, not during just this time, but over the last five years, that when the pressure is applied, when they have to put their faith out on display, and when it, they've got to make it their own, it's proved to not be real. And they end up being atheists. They're not going to just be like idle. It's very clear they're anti-God once that thing gets tested. And it's one of the most heartbreaking things as a campus minister at a, at a university in Kentucky that I have to deal with is when I see that occur. Because your faith is going to be tested. Every one of us is going to have that. And maybe it's been tested this year. If it hasn't, be ready. It's probably coming. You know, And that's how God shows us whether we're true or we're not, whether we're one of his or not. And so just know that that's to be expected. Expected The floods are going to come, and we're going to see that. Foundations do matter. Our foundational beliefs, our mindset, our heart, all those things have got to be right. It doesn't matter what's going on on the outside. It matters what's going on in here. That's what Jesus is showing us here in this passage today. So as we close out here, I want to have kind of a time of response, of invitation, of prayer, where we all need to take a good, hard look at our lives. I got, I got to tell you, I got places I need to work on for sure. And I'm sure you do as well. But let's really just be obedient in this moment to listen to what the Holy Spirit has to say to us, to really show us what's been going on in life, what's really, really been happening. Where are our foundations? Are they solid? Are they built on the rock? Or are they on, on the just bare ground? And, and when the storms come, are they going to be? Are we going to be blown to bits? Are we not going to be able to stand? Because see, here's the thing that we need to remember as we're closing out. Jesus doesn't accept renovation projects. Okay, this isn't like my wife's favorite show, Fixer Upper, with Chip and Joanna Gaines. It might be yours too. I'm sorry, but like, it's not a renovation project. You can't just put a, a little bit of paint on it and some shiplap siding, and it's all going to be good. It doesn't work that way. Jesus says it's all or nothing. It's not a renovation project. You can't take this thing and continue to just make it look better with better veneers and better furniture and better stuff. It's what's under the surface that matters. He also doesn't accept addition projects. And I see this all the time with young people, but this may be many of you today. You've, you've decided to be like this addition, this like cantilever, this appendage uh, onto the side of someone else's faith. It might be your families, uh, it might be your friends, it might be people within your church where you have grafted yourself onto the side there. And a cantilever is a type of structure, so I gotta pray, play architect one more time. But the structure has no foundation. It just kind of hangs off the main structure. And so Jesus makes it pretty clear, like you can't be that either. You can't have this sort of Christian construction and veneer that's kind of hanging off somebody else's because you have no foundation. Matter of fact, when literal storms come, those things are typically what blow off of buildings because they're not attached to anything. So we can't do that. We can't build off one another's faith. We've got to have our own, have our own foundation that is on the rock of Jesus. And so all that he says that can happen here, there's only one option. That means you've got to demolish the old so a new house can be built. That's it. That's the only option. For, so for some of you today, maybe you've been playing church for a long time. Maybe you haven't. I don't know. Uh, maybe you've been trying to do a bunch of good works, good things, trying to live this moral lifestyle. And you've realized that that's just not going to cut it. 
You really don't know Jesus. You actually have not dug down to the rock. You have not repented of your sin. And today, today would be a great day to, for you. The, the end of this year, like chalk it up, 2020, I'm done. I'm done with trying to live this fake life of Christianity, trying to be done with this like Christian veneer I've been putting on. And I'm going to go down and I'm going to actually trust in Christ. He's going to be it. He's going to be the Lord of every aspect of my life. And so I want to challenge you today. That might be your next step is to put your faith and trust in Christ and repent of your sins. So some of you, that really is what you need to do today. You've got to demolish the old. You've got to bury it, be done with it. Um, because you can't just fix this thing. You can't just renovate it. It's got to be done with. But for others of us, myself included on this one, I'm going to, I'm going to chalk myself in with this one here. A lot of us who are saved, who know the Lord Jesus, who have lived the Christian life, unfortunately have allowed the world and its systems and its sins and temptations to cause us to build things onto our house that are not of him. They, we, he is not Lord of every aspect of our life. And we've got some of these appendages, appendages, these cantilevers, these bump outs, whatever you want to call them, if we're thinking kind of in terms of the building metaphor here, that need to be ripped off. It's just time to take those things off. We've got a solid foundation. We've got a solid main house. But so many other things have come into our life, and they're just attached onto this. And honestly, maybe you've already had them ripped off with the storms of COVID. I don't know. But I promise you, God will rip those things off at some point. And so today will be a great day to turn from that and just say, God, I'm done with this. I'm going to bury this addiction. I'm going to bury this sin. I'm done with this thing. I want to follow you. I want to pursue you. I want you to be Lord of every aspect of my life, not just part of it, not just some of my house, but like all of my house. I want you to take control of all of it. And so th that's definitely me. I have allowed some things in my life that are, are just not of God. And it's not like intentional even. These are just things that creep in. And so, again, as we look at 2020, we look at finishing out this year, we look at COVID and all that's going on, assess that in your life today. Maybe that's you, and maybe as a believer, you've got to take some of this stuff off. Be done with it, bury it, and repent of your sin, and trust, let, trust in Christ and allow Him to be Lord of every aspect of your life. And so what have you been building your house on? Has it been on the rock? Has it been on a solid foundation? Or has it been built on top of the ground? Is it built on the gospel or is it built on world systems? What has COVID-19, what has 2020 shown you? Really take some time over these next few days and reflect on that. So let's go deep with the Lord. Let's go all the way down and put our foundation on the solid rock of Jesus as we close out this year. I want to pray for us. And again, I just want you to be obedient as the Holy Spirit has maybe brought some things to your mind and just encourage you to repent of that sin or whatever's going on and to trust in Christ if you've never done that. So let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning and um, just thank you for the opportunity to be here in Bethel and to fill in for Pastor Charlie. I'm just praying for him this morning as well. But God, your word, um, no doubt, uh, convicts us of many things. And uh, it's been a tough year. It's not been easy. We've all had a lot of questions. We've all faced a lot of storms. And we've all not known exactly what we should do. But your word makes it so clear that we just need to allow your Holy Spirit to expose those areas of us that are not built on you and what you call us to do and be obedient to you. There's places where we're not obedient are very clearly areas that we have not surrendered to your Lordship. So I pray this morning that we would do that. Those who are followers of Christ would submit those areas. And if that means ripping them out of our life, then let's do it. If we need to bury these things, then let's do it. But whatever it is, God, I pray that we would just be obedient to what your Holy Spirit is calling us to do. And God, I pray for those who haven't ever trusted in Christ and his work on the cross. I pray that they would respond in faith today and they would repent of their sins and give their life to you. And start off this new year living for you as Lord of their life. So God, I thank you for this church. I thank you for this congregation. I thank you for what it means to me. Pray blessings over everyone here. I pray all this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Take care and God bless.